right. Well, welcome to our Meet the Expert interview that we just started this new series. It's super exciting. I am Cassandra Hesseltine, the Film Commissioner for Humboldt and Delaware Counties. And would you please uh, enlighten us who you are and what your, your title is in the film industry? Yeah, hi, Cassandra. My name's uh, John McLeod, and I'm a special effects coordinator for the motion picture industry and uh, mm -hmm. television also. That's awesome. So for the people who are checking this out who might not know what that is, can you let us know kind of more in detail what, what does that job entail? The job description is, uh, the fundamental description I would say would be wind, rain, fire, smoke. And that's kind of the base uh, fundamental stuff that we work on. And then beyond that, we do a lot of pyrotechnics, we do a lot of uh, rigging. We do a lot of car prep for stunt people, mechanical, any kind of mechanical gadgetry that's dreamed up by the director or the production company. And they pretty much leave it to us to try to come up with designs and work with the director coming up with the idea. Do you know how, I, I, you know, as you were describing what the job is i was wondering how the title came about do you know where the special effects came from like why do they call it that special yeah i i, I just always thought of it was was special as far as out of the ordinary yeah and effects you know how you're affecting the film i think that makes that's sense. Where, yeah yeah there's a lot of confusion between visual effects and nowadays every time i'm on a show and if i'm on a show with somebody where there's a John that's also the visual effects guy, <laughs> it gets really confusing. So, oh, I bet. Yeah, there's. Yeah, we we interviewed. Um, we did interview uh, Elon, who you, I think you probably worked with on Thirteen Reasons Why. Yeah. Yeah. And so I, we interviewed I did, him. I looked at that uh, his interview a little bit too. It was interesting. Yeah. So it was nice to learn the difference there, as you're pointing out that those are two different things, but can yeah. probably be confusing. Yeah, and over the years, special effects was its own entity. You know, there was really no other version or spin-off from it. But now with the visual effects, then there's creature effects, and all these different effects groups kind of came on board. So it got kind of confusing. A lot of times, they refer to us as practical effects or physical ah. effects. But nowadays, yeah, the term special sense. effects kind of incorporates everybody nowadays. Right. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, so I took a look at your projects that you, you've done uh, over the past, uh, what is it, three decades, four, almost four decades. Yeah. And it's an amazing uh, list of, of work, body of work, just to name a few. Obviously, we already talked about 13 Reasons Why, um, but Sense8, Jurassic World, Aviator, Face Off, um, uh, Mrs. Doubtfire, I thought that was great. Oh, yeah. uh, Indiana Jones, you know, Star Trek, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean, you know, you've done different, different ones of those. Um, it, it was just such a great body of work, you know. So tell us a little bit about um, maybe one of those projects, you know, how, how what, what, what's it like to work on something that big, you know? Yeah, I, I kind of fell into it early with Lucasfilm, you know, a lot of the really large scale films like E.T., Poltergeist, Raiders, and we were exposed to, you know, great directors and great actors and, and a lot of really talented people all, all across the board. But for me, you know, those shows, the scale of them really didn't hit me till later on. When we were on them, it didn't, it felt like more of a, a group project where it wasn't this massive show. I think later on in my career, some of the movies I was on, you know, with the Batmans and Wind Talkers and the hunted cliffhanger. Then I started realizing, hey, these are these are large scale. The way we're trying to approach this, and just all the equipment, the people, the the food services, everything that right. comes. With it, the better you know, the food trucks were, the the bigger yeah. the movie. <laughs> <laughs> well, the tents, right? You can always count the tents. Like, holy, uh -huh. God, you got seven or eight big tents out there, like a circus coming to town, or the trailers. You know, just you could just right. pick up on the scale of the equipment. But yeah, right. I think later on, the, all that really started to change and the scale of the stuff started to hit me, like how many people were on the crew. Some of the shows we had up to a hundred people, so. Right. 
a lot of good so, talented people on board. How did you fall into you? You mentioned a second ago Lucasfilm. So how did you fall into this industry? Well, I I got really pretty lucky. My father worked in as he was an electric. He worked mm -hmm. as a gaffer a little bit and worked in the electric department. And as he, you know, I was racing motorcycles quite a bit. I was kind of a, a side career I was hoping I was gonna go off into. And then uh, injuries came their way and I had to segue, I had to focus on, you know, my work with the, with the production companies. And that's about when I started working with Lucasfilm. But I was bouncing in and out of the industry, but mainly it was from mechanical work with the motorcycles, did a lot of fabrication, a lot of design work and just keeping the bikes running it really fit into the special effects industry really well where they were at the point they really needed fabrication and mechanical mm -hmm. type people so once i got my foot in the door there then the good guys i worked underneath would take me off to train me with the pyrotechnics and there's so many facets the pneumatics the hydraulics there were so many specialists that were involved on in working on the films. So they pulled me in and kind of, you gain your experience, I'm still gaining experience, still learning. But that's kind of what led me into the industry was mainly motorcycle racing. Oh, interesting. And, and um, so what do you, what do you, what would you say that you love about your job now that you, you are in it um, and, and that you didn't, you know, pursue uh, motorcycles or continue with that, that you went into this? What, what, what do you say that you fell in love with? Well, it, it had similar, similar effects, you know, as far as kind of a timeline pressure and, you know, everything, you had to nail it, you know, it was kind of like similar to racing where you had to kind of put the moment aside and really focus on what you're trying to achieve. And it's creative too, where you're, they're giving you projects that you're really kind of taxing yourself trying to figure out how to do it. And sometimes now later on in, later in the career, I'm using memories of all these different gags that I've worked on and it just kind of comes to me easier, mm -hmm. even if it's a totally different project. But the creative part is really what attracted me. I was, you know, really enjoyed the design work, the fabrication, the whatever the automation and then actuating the effect in front of the film company. Because a lot of these things were not necessarily, um, it sounds like, you know, you might repeat something like rain. How do we make, how do we create rain? You know, once that was discovered how to do that for a film, you know, you can just, it's, there's a process that existed, but right. it sounds like there was other things that you would have to do specific for a movie that you had to be creative and figure out how do we solve this problem? How do we do this when Correct. maybe it hadn't been done before, only partially kind of had been done. Yeah. Well, like there was a lot of projects that we, uh, we worked with, along with the director, you know, with the stunt people, and definitely they were designing stuff that had not been done before. And that what's an example of, of a project that, that that had to happen on? Well, let's see. I, I think there was a lot of them actually, but one of the big ones that comes to mind is uh, we did that air to, air to air transfer on Cliffhanger, the opening oh. scene in the movie. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That was all. That was all live. That wasn't visual effects that whole that was kind of the turning point where visual effects really started showing up in the film productions but we did that uh we had a stunt man named Simon Payne mm -hmm. and we were flying in two different jets out over Colorado and we actually rigged we built winches mm -hmm. that lowered him from one plane on the long line down to another plane wow so my partner was in the upper plane it was a DC nine and then I was down below in a Bell Jet Star. And it was picked because the door opened inward, you know, mm -hmm. which is unusual mm -hmm. for a for a plane. Mm -hmm. So that way they were able to open the open the door in flight. And we had all the rigging coming down. We flew up and then we grabbed onto a weight, which had the rope attached to it, pulled the rope into the plane, and then I started winching and we we traveled Simon down the rope from the DC nine to the Bell Jet Star. Wow. And that was, I think it's, I'm not sure if it is still, but 
for a while there was the most expensive stunt in history on the Whoa. Guinness Book of World Records. And so that was, you know, the designing of the winches, the building of the winches, mm -hmm. and then actually taking it out into the field and, and putting it all to a test was uh, Was that scary? Amazing. Very mm -hmm. scary. Hoping yeah. it worked. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it worked. Yeah, and it didn't go perfectly, of course. But yeah, uh, yeah we had a couple little things that could have gone real, real wrong. Uh, just basically the way the jets were flying. They kind of overran, they overran the weight, which oh. we were flying up to pick up at the front door. And so when they flew past the weight, it could have gone into the jet engine. Oh gosh. Yeah. That could have been bad. That, 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 <laughs> I wouldn't be doing this interview. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But no, Glad that was- that uh, didn't happen. Yeah, um, would, yeah. That whole show, the, we worked in Italy. We did a lot of work in Italy and, and a lot of climbing stuff, a lot of high altitude helicopter work and a lot of rigging, a lot of explosions. So it, that, that show in general was a real highlight for me. I really enjoyed it. That, that's awesome. So let's ask you another question. So um, we have people that live here in Northern California and Humboldt and Del Norte counties that are interested in going into production. And uh -huh. often they don't know the different departments, you know, they don't know the different areas besides, you know, everyone wants to be a director, writer, producer, you know, the main things that people know about. Right. What recommendations do you have for anybody who wants to pursue a path in special effects? Um, what training or aptitude does one need for something like this? Uh, like I was saying, there's a lot of different expertises in the business in special effects. Mm -hmm. And so, I mean, you can't really be a master of all of them, but the it's a good basic fundamental start would be maybe electronics, maybe machine tooling, uh, fabrication, like how I came in, uh, design, uh, that I think, and mathematics, trigonometry, uh, yeah, all the basics in high school and college really segue really pays off once you start working in the field. But I think if you had a specialty in any one of those, also we do mold mold making quite a bit. Mm -hmm. So we have specialists that come in there, maybe a mold maker. We have maybe a hot shot metal work, working guy. Then we have an electronics guy. Then we'll have a mechanical engineering type partner involved. Me mechanical engineering would be what I wished I had furthered my education into mm. because there are so many times where I'm trying to crunch formulas, building or designing something where you just, you want to know the exact number so you could build in your safety factor. But I think right. any of it that. It sounds like you have, there's a lot of safety that goes into, I mean, there's on any film set, you always have to be safe with different things, you know, weapons, stunts, cars, all of those kind of things. Exactly. But that's like with a lot of what you guys do, if you have an explosion or you have fire or any of that, that you need to be, you know, obviously super safe. Yeah. Yeah. The pyrotechnics, luckily it's pretty much on, you could go out and work with firework companies a little bit for training. They take mm -hmm. on like apprentices and that's probably, that gives you a real good idea of the electronics and the wiring and and being safe with the with the charges or the pyrotechnics and uh but a lot of that you kind of got to wait you get your foot in the door through other avenues whether it's hydraulics or design or mechanics and then you start picking up on all the the training or the work experience as pyrotech as a pyrotechnician so that's uh and then there's a licensing in California. I go. I went through a licensing period from probably 1980 until, oh shoot, I guess 1980 through 1995, where you elevate your licenses of your pyrotechnic card. Oh, that so that makes gives sense. you permission from the state fire marshal to operate yeah. on the film sets and get the permits from the fire departments. If that makes sense. Yeah, somebody's really interested in just pyrotechnics. That's also a way that you can come into special effects. So, um, what's an epic story that you have working on a project? Besides, you know, you just told us obviously the cliffhanger one. Um, what What are some other epic stories you have of working on 
I mean, like, let's say for instance, Indiana Jones, what did you do on that? Shoot, well, I, I worked, yeah, the first one was the Raiders. So I worked on Raiders and we did a lot of the, uh, we did a lot of the stuff with the, with the submarines that were out and we had them out in the bay. Mm -hmm. And then we had miniatures that we were using in the bay also. And then we did the whole sequence where the, uh, the tail end of the movie where the arc explodes when they finally find the arc and they open it up. Yeah. And all the different characters, one of them, like we did the face melting of one of them. The and famous we, face, the guy that melts? Yeah. Wow. And we did the, uh, we did the other one where it's kind of gory, but his face caved in. Yeah, like, a, yeah. like a vacuum down yeah or disintegrated yes and then we did the uh the last one was the head exploding and that was we worked on that for gosh we must have worked on that for a month and a half wow we had, practicing we had, just exploding heads <laughs> well yeah exactly exactly spielberg wanted it to be a certain look and oh, every wow. time we do it well, we had like a bust of a of the man. It was an exact copy of him, a life cast. And then we were creating all these different materials to put in, to put in the head to make it look realistic. Yeah. And trying to, at first we were trying to, this sounds kind of crazy, but we we're trying to blow it apart with explosives. And then we realized that it had a certain look that Steven mm -hmm. didn't like. So we had to kind of disintegrate it from the outside also. So we did a combination after many tests and many different shots at high speed. We did a combination of, uh, we had a couple of shotguns facing the head along with the pyrotechnics. And then the arms were on a hinge where they would flap open. And the first one we tried, the face completely blew off and landed in the hand, which was kind of comical, but wasn't what he was looking for. Not the look he was looking for, yeah. And that's when we incorporated the, uh, the shotguns because we wanted to fragment all the parts as it was coming apart. So wow. that, that sequence alone, I think I worked on that probably, probably two months, just, just the opening of the arc, the arc lid blowing off and yeah. spinning up into the sky. And back then it was, you know, it wasn't visual effects. It was a lot of practical or miniature effects to create right. and then that makes sense yeah. yeah yeah that was that's incredible yeah that was a that was a lot of work uh we did a lot of the uh stuff that was in the u.s on the continent here traveled around for just the shots with the smoke and the fires and the explosions but, but then that was like a post-production shot we did we did all oh, the arc sense. opening stuff back in the studio right. at lucasfilm Right, that makes sense. Yeah, that wouldn't necessarily need to be during the regular filming. Right, and then so then I worked on also uh, Temple of Doom was the next one. Uh -huh. and we did a whole miniature mine shaft flooding sequence, and then uh, we did the uh, airplane stuff where uh, I think it was Kate Capshaw goes out of the plane. With a air, with a uh, like an inflatable raft, she lands on a ski slope, slides down the ski slope that was up in Mammoth, and then goes off a little cliff into a river. That was the American River up here near Sacramento, and then uh, basically that that show we there's uh, units all over the world, and we were just doing the U.S. the U.S. continent stuff. So that was. Uh, Number two, the number three uh, was Last Crusade. Mm -hmm. I worked on the all the motorcycle, excuse me, the sequence there where the right Sean Connery and Harrison mm -hmm. Ford were in the motorcycle with the sidecar and they got into a jousting where they right. jousted with another guy, stuck the, stuck the jousting pole into the front wheel of the motorcycle and we blew the motorcycle up in the air to flip. So that was all live action that we did out here in uh, West Marin. So basically you get to play with toys and blow things up is yeah. what I'm hearing you say. <laughs> now you can Who see how want this job? it was kind of similar to racing motorcycles, right? It kind of fit. And actually the guys, a lot of the guys on the team, the stunt team were 
guys I used to race motorcycles with. So, so when you say race motorcycles, are you talking about like street or like paved? Oh no, I, yeah, I raced motocross or, for many years. Motocross. Okay, yeah. my son did motocross, and um, uh, I was married to a man who did street um, road race. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, road race. That's what, yeah. Yeah, like MotoGP, but he didn't do MotoGP, but you know, that kind of, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So that's cool. You know all about it then. Yeah. I do. I yes. Trip to the hospital. <laughs> yes. Yes. Many. Yes. My son is already broken his back and he's 16. Oh. So he's fine, but he did break his back doing a wheelie. So yes, I sure hear that. be destined to do some type of stunt work now. <laughs> yeah, right. He might have to. Yeah. I, actually, that's what ended my career. I, I broke three vertebrae in my back. So. That's yeah. when I turned, okay, this is limited time on the motorcycle. It's been better off focusing on my film career. Right. That so you, but you're still able to create things, like you said, but just not actually be the stunt person that's going to do it. Right. Yeah. But it must be fun to still watch other people do the stunt that you've created and see it be successful. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I mixed it up for a few years there where the stunt guys would talk to me. I would go back and do certain things where they knew it fit my skill set, I guess. Yeah. I'd be working as an effects man. They'd say, hey, John, can you come ride this motorcycle for us and jump over this canal or whatever it is? And I'm okay, yeah, no problem. Sounds like fun. Right. Yeah, it was pretty safe and sane, the stuff I would pick out to do, because once you have that back injury, you got to be pretty careful. Yeah, that is true, for sure. Um, so again, you know, we have people who um, want to, you know, who are interested in working in the industry. Um, and we have projects now that are, you know, wanting to come to Northern California since filming's opened up back in California. Um, how do you see filming, you know, right now during uh, the pandemic? And how and it filming people filming throughout California versus leaving the state, you know, how what's your take on the industry right now? Yeah, I'm still really trying to figure it out. I know there's small, small productions gearing up around the Bay Area and Southern California, and I think out in Texas and Atlanta, they're trying to do projects. I know mm -hmm. a lot of the ones in Southern California, they're trying to control in a studio mm -hmm. situation. I think it's because they could monitor who it's not like coming into an airport almost. But I right. think I think it's going to change how we used to operate a lot. I think all the food serving is going to be prepackaged. The crews are going to be probably smaller, which isn't always a great thing for the people looking to come into the business. But right. maybe once the vaccine comes out, we'll be back to more of a normal operating procedure. But uh, yeah, it seems to me the way the buffet style food service and the big mm -hmm. food tents, it's just, it's got to change. And I think a lot of the uh, protocol on the set where, you know, you're very close to the actors and it's hard to social distance when you mm -hmm. got a 10 by 10 room and there's six or eight people in there trying to operate and do their job. And then you got the actors on top of that. So right. I think the studios allow them a little more control where, mm -hmm. you know, they're building the sets. It's not in an actual location, somebody's house where mm -hmm. you know, they're able to ventilate it and do whatever they need to do. To yeah, we've sure. worked on, uh, we created, you know, we took the, the white paper um, that the state put out, the 22 pages of proposed ideas of how you work in pods and how you have a compliance officer to take everyone's temperature. And like you said, lock down and control the set, you know, whether you're at a studio or if you are on location, they're trying to mimic what you would do in a studio to control that you still also do while you're on location. Um, right. And then yeah. we've taken that a step farther here in Humboldt and Del Norte, um, where we're helping them, you know, with like hotels that might, you know, section off the crew so that they're not mingling with the regular community and they're, they're protected. Both sides are protected. Um, you know, as well as work training uh, registered nurses here to be compliance officers because they'll know the whole health, medical field here and help the productions um, with all those details and kind of tailor specific to each production. So yeah, so it's going to be really interesting, the new things that we have to do and the productions that have been wanting to come to us because they haven't been wanting to film outside of California. Like I have one that was supposed to film on the East Coast and now has come to us and said, well, we probably don't want to fly out there 
even though they, it involves flying here too, but they just feel like closer to home or within their state. And so it's been very interesting. Right. Um, but I want to talk about a project that we actually had filmed up here that you worked on, um, which is ET. So we had part of ET, the external, um, like where he's trying to phone home next to the tree stump. Right. Um, was up in Del Norte County. I know that they took some plates of the trees where you see ET on the bicycle, or you know, the boy on the bicycle yep. with with ET in the in the basket of the bicycle. So we have little uh, parts that that we were part of. That was pretty right. exciting. Were you part of any of that that came up here? Yeah. You yeah, were. I was just talking to Nate about that. You know, we did a lot of the stuff with the flying bicycle. A lot of that was in front of a blue screen in a, in San Rafael, California, at George Lucas, the ILM studios mm -hmm. back then. But then oh, we I've been to that one. I've yeah, we were, that one. Yeah, so we'd travel out and get the plates, get it, whatever shots we could get, lead ups, like you're saying, with the redwood trees and mm -hmm. and the but the film I really remember spending a lot of time up in your area was uh return of the jedi which yeah. was called revenge of the jedi right and that was up in crescent city also right endor yeah yeah and then yep. we had the speeder chase scene in humboldt where they go underneath the tree exactly cheatham grove down here in humboldt and then endor was up in um Delmar county so yeah that pretty now, exciting yeah i think the uh I was involved in that in the speeder bike stuff quite a bit too after that was after the main production was over mm. we did the first unit all, all the live action stuff I can't remember the property but it was right there near the Smith River I think Jedediah Forest yeah that was indoor yeah indoor, you were at Jedediah that, Smith yeah. State Park yeah, yeah by battle, Smith River yeah battle for indoor or what yeah so yeah. anyway yeah we spent a lot of time in the redwoods there and then after the show was over we went down and did the speeder bike stuff kind of in a post-production mode right because you were scrubbing plates because you added them on on after yeah. yeah well um so you know then how beautiful our area is and it's oh, yeah. not a hard sell for me <laughs> to try to sell it you know when the productions are interested in us yeah well, that's, that's the number yeah, one reason yeah. they come to us is for those trees well, it's so unique. Yeah, anywhere in the world would recognize that. That's, yeah, I, I think the, uh, my time up in Crescent City was really awesome. You know, just working in the redwoods, working along the rivers, you know, staying in the town there. Yeah, you know, the Smith ocean. River is amazing. Uh, we actually had a bird box filmed on the Smith River with Sandra Bullock a couple right. years ago for Netflix. And that, all of that river scene is the Smith River in yeah. Del Norte by Crescent City. Did River Wild come up there also? I'm trying to remember. I thought they I did. do not believe that no, I no, no, yeah. yeah. They're not on our list. Yeah. Uh, I'm sure they probably scouted. Yeah. 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 They asked me to work in that film. I'm trying to remember where they ended up doing it. But yeah. Not yeah. too long after uh I think that was pretty close to cliffhanger time. time yeah, period. an amazing yeah plethora of projects that you've worked on that are so amazing. Um, I want to ask you also again too, so going from, you know, people who want to work in the industry and maybe do that kind of a job, but people who are here locally who want to, you know, what does our local crew and local vendors need to know in relation to helping you out with your job? If someone here, if we had a big movie that came and special effects needed some locals to hire some locals, what would our local crew need to know or what would a local vendor who might supply you with things need to know to help out the special effects department? Well, I think as far as a crew, you know, a lot of times we pull from people like when we go to towns that aren't uh, real busy with productions all the time. I mean, we've pulled guys from automotive mechanical type shops. We pull guys from machine, machine tool shops sheet metal shops uh boy all those are really handy with what we do you know the mm -hmm. in the fabrication and and just having people with good mechanical aptitude always pays off and they could pick up things and you know be comfortable in the world we work in and be safe but the uh, as far as the vendors go we're always real heavy with metal so like steel supplies aluminum supplies uh, hardware supplies, lumber, of course, 
a lot of the stuff will ship in if it's real specialty items, which we use a McMaster car quite a bit. That's the catalog. It pretty much has all the little mechanical gadgets in it. And uh, what else do we have? Uh, yeah, the welding supplies, the gases. A lot of times we're looking for propane or we're looking for welding gases or we're looking for nitrogen to drive some of the units that we're working with. But and if you're doing a night shoot, they should have their cell phone ringer on in the middle of yeah. the night. <laughs> I've had a few yeah. of the middle of the night phone calls during night yeah, shoots I that bet. happened here. Yeah, yeah, well that's a big panic, right? If you're working nights, then the supplies during the day have to happen. And it's like, when you run out of stuff at night, a lot of times we get our vendors, like I know some of the big propane companies I've dealt with. Mm -hmm. I always go, okay, who's your go-to guy after hours? Yeah. And usually they feed us somebody's number that gets that duty where they might get a call at three in the morning. Yeah, hey, you have to have it. Yeah. That's, yeah, you have to have those numbers, especially when yeah. you're shooting around the clock. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah, because, yeah, then the hard thing about doing that work for us, you know, a lot of the business we deal with, that's after hours for them. So having right. access to that shop or to those people that can get you the parts at the right. time of night, that's, that's really handy. So for a rural area, it would be really good that if our, if our people here kept that in mind when they're working with the production, it's not always nine to five, Monday through Friday, it could be seven days a week, middle of the night, and to be flexible in, in, in knowing that something like that could happen. Yeah, I forgot. Yeah, you brought that up. It's a good point. You know, the weekend work is pretty common, too, on a lot mm -hmm. of the films. So, yeah, a lot of the Saturdays and Sundays aren't recognized as days off, unfortunately. Yeah. But, yeah, having access to equipment or supplies or products like the lumber, the steel, the welding gases, that's all that's got to happen on Saturday or on Sunday also. So you mentioned that you you ideally you were going to go into motorcycles, and instead you know it took a turn um, you know because of injuries and you ended up working in the movie industry. Do you regret it? What do you think now when you look back on your on your life and all these amazing epic movies that you realized later were big, not at the time but became big later, like and all these adventures and stories you have, like what do you what do you think now about all oh, that? I think I was really lucky, you know, the, the time that I came into the industry and the way the industry's evolved as, over the years and it's changed quite a bit. I mean, dramatically it's changed, but I think the years that I, my beginning years were fantastic. And then the middle years when I was kind of really hitting my stride, it, it couldn't have been better. A little, little more travel. I've traveled all over the world. So, but a lot of times we go away for six months to nine months you know, working on these projects. So as I got older in my career, that became a little tougher, you know, when you start to have family and relationships and trying right. to maintain all that. But it's, it's been great. You know, I've worked with thousands of people and worked all over the world and learned from everybody, even if they're new people on the crew, they all seem to bring something to the table. That's, oh, you that's know, neat. very handy and very interesting. And, and how, so as you talked about that, you know, you had kind of like a beginning in the middle and then, you know, towards the, you know, more recent part of your career, how would you say, um, and you touched on it a little bit before about visual effects, but how has your job changed as visual effects came in and started becoming part of the process? Yeah, I think, uh, unfortunately for us, it seems like a lot of the planning and the commitment ahead of time to do it, okay, hey, we're gonna do, there. I mean, when I started, there was no other way. It was like, you read right. the script, you broke down the individual gags, and it was like, you had to figure out some way to come up with the ideas or the products that would bring their vision to fruition, right? And then- There was no you know, fixing it in post. <laughs> yeah, that wasn't an option, and yeah. then when I, yeah, so it was it, a lot of the stuff we did was wire work. You know, we used to fly people on piano wires, and uh, everything was looking back on it, it. It just it was a lot more critical in the beginning years because of the safety mm -hmm. factors and the training that was required. And now with the uh, 
now that visual effects has become part of the process, there's a little more indecision with some of the production companies, which way they want to go. Mm. And so a lot of the stuff now is they may not decide it right up front and then you get into the show and they go, okay, all right, we're going to push that off to visual effects. I know you've been working on it. Take that and put it aside. Or at the last minute they go, Hey, we were planning on doing this visual effects. Now we, we could do it live. Right. So let's do everything wow. you can to pull it off last minute. So that's, that's become a little more hectic. It'd Just be happened. nice if they, if the three departments, you know, the production and then the visual and you all came together and decided ahead of time in pre-production, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That's huge. And it's a lot of times, you know, it's the director wanting to see things first or it, mm -hmm. the, the story may evolve as he moves into it and the ideas change and all of a sudden something you've been planning and building now, so that doesn't fit what he's, what his vision is. So we got to shift. Okay, we'll do this much. Visual effects can cover the, the background stuff. We'll just try to enter, uh, enter into the close range stuff in front of camera and visual effects may fill in the background. So yeah, it's, it's interesting. Every, it depends on what we're talking about too. If we're talking about buildings getting knocked down in New York or San Francisco, that's just right. not going to happen, right? Right. You're gonna <laughs> well, let's hope not. <laughs> yeah, you're, you're not. <laughs> not in, yeah, I shouldn't say that. Yeah, but yeah. The, uh, a couple of the films I worked on, like Body of Lies, I know I came into it and they were planning on visual effects because we were in Washington D.C. and and I asked, talking with Ridley Scott, you know, he he wants to do everything live action. He's old mm -hmm. school mm -hmm. film director, and he's he knows what he could do live action. He knows what's out of the question, but. In Washington, there was a real paranoia because we were working right next to the Capitol. Oh. And the area, there were some car explosions that he had planned on doing. And they, when I came on the show, they were all going, he's going to, he's, he knows we got to do this visual effects. I go, well, have we even asked the question? And they said, no, no, you're not going to be able, you know, locations was telling me, you're not going to be able to do this. There's no way we're too close to the Capitol. I said, can we at least ask permission and see what happens? Because Ridley really wants to do it. Back then, I was traveling back and forth from DC to uh, at Los Angeles for meetings. And Ridley was, he wanted to do everything he could live action. So I went out and kind of pushed that a little bit. And then they got me a meeting with the fire marshal in Washington, DC. And then everybody came to that. It was police, fire, all the interns, everybody. I mean, it was one of the biggest production meetings I've been in just to try <laughs> to get permission to do these car explosions. But eventually they gave us, they said there are certain things we couldn't use. Mm -hmm. And one of them was liquid uh, fuel for any of the explosions. And so I said, okay, we got ways around that. And, we have we use different products, different chemicals that don't require hazardous, you know, flammable liquids because they're very nervous about fire in this one neighborhood. And then right. uh, we worked with them, got it done. Oh, we had the bomb squad too. Everybody was very nervous about it, but they gave us permission to do it. And wow! Yeah, we blew the three cars up two blocks from the Capitol. So the was exciting. I got back in the elevator after ride after being in the meeting with all the people and I said well Ridley really why well, he didn't come out here to make a cartoon we want to do this we want to do this live action and nice. it involved a lot of stunt people we even had dummies you know the whole explosion was supposed to be in Amsterdam so it was like a kind of like a farmer's market looking place mm -hmm. and but anyway uh, yeah so that was where I actually uh, then we went to Baltimore, and then there was row houses, and that was going to be a visual uh, visual effects explosion. And after talking to Ridley, I said, if we move down like three three houses, there's an empty house there, and we can make that look like it's coming apart. And you'll have your whole shot. You won't need visual effects. Wow. Saving them, saving them money and then having the actors involved without all right. the – so he was all on board with that. Yeah, I'll check it so out. So we, whoop, I lost you. Okay, thanks. Thanks. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.
can you hear me? So anyway, yeah, yeah. yeah, so anyway, uh, they gave us permission, locations, got the, got the location okayed with us. And then we did the, uh, in the movie, it, it looks like uh, it's supposed to be England. The opening uh -huh. scene in the movie, a SWAT team comes up on the, all the row houses or these brick buildings. And as they get to the front of it, the, there's a guy that blows the whole place up. He's working on a, on a bomb up in the building. Oh, okay. Well, that's incredible that you get to just play with toys. <laughs> that's what I'm well, hearing. Yeah. That's my takeaway. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I led into that. I'm not sure if that's what you're trying to get at, but it was just... No, uh, no, it's cool. Yeah, it's cool hearing all your stories. I mean, I think that, you know, it's just, it's just amazing, yeah, to hear, you know, um, what it's like for individuals working on these productions, you know? I mean, I think it's really, it's really interesting for us and, and our audience. Yeah, yeah, and it's, a, and unfortunately, hopefully you get to see that, uh, we'll work out that, uh, the clip, the video clip, that's all from the movie Grindhouse, which I did with Robert Rodriguez and Quentin Tarantino. Right. But that shows a good array of pretty much everything we do. And that's it, awesome. Start to finish. I mean, it, it's kind of got little categories in it as you go through it. Yeah. It's pretty fun to watch. Yeah, we'll definitely play it. We'll we'll yeah. we'll we'll cut it into this so that our audience can see, you know, physically for themselves, besides hearing what you did that they'll be able to see it. So yeah, that's amazing. So do you have any final thoughts for um, the Redwood region in regards to filming or just anybody who's watching this in regards to filming who doesn't work in the industry that may want to or doesn't know how to or any final thoughts for us? Yeah, well, I think, like I've told my son, I mean, definitely getting your education helps a ton. You know, whether it's in mathematics or if it's in electronics or if it's in mach machine tool design or work, I think uh, I think that puts you right in, puts you right on the doorstep of being really handy for a crew. And the uh, I think the uh, just having people that are willing to work long hours and unfortunately, a lot of times conditions are tough. And you know, if you have a positive attitude and try to look at the bright side of everything. I think it pays off for the people you're working with and you in, in the long run. But I think, I think the Northern Cal uh, area is beautiful, you know, with all the, the locations and all that. I know, I know the supplies are probably kind of far and few between it, but I think, you know, once you get in and get established and the businesses get used to working with film companies, I think, uh, I think it's going to be a huge asset to everybody. Mm hmm Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time, John. Oh my God. I love hearing your story, especially about hearing about being up here, you know, so that, that is so awesome that you've actually filmed in our area. And so I really, oh, yeah. appreciate, really appreciate your time talking to us today. Thank you. I appreciate it also. Sorry. Hopefully I answered your questions. I tend to segue off and. Oh no, it's perfect. <laughs> They're just prompts, one. you know? Yeah, yeah. No worries. Really appreciate you. Well, thank you. Same here.